So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so this talk is about international education and Drupal. So some of the uh, trials and uh, problems and unique challenges that um, I face uh, for my department at Georgia Institute of Technology. So who am I? Uh, my name is Jimmy Kriegel. Um, I study at Georgia Tech in cybersecurity. Uh, my main job is to be an IT support professional. So I kind of do a lot of the IT stuff and also a big part is the web development aspect of it and application development. Um, this is my 11th DrupalCon and so I thought this would be a good time to give back and kind of share some of the stuff I've learned from all these talks on there. Uh, this is my uh, cat that I just adopted named Lark. Uh, he likes to stick his tongue out. So um, what is the Office of International Education? So we kind of have a couple different uh, smaller units inside of our department. So we handle all of the international students coming in and scholars. Um, so we make sure they, their immigration is correct. We keep them legal. We make sure they're in the right classes, all the stuff so they can stay here um, for the duration of their study. We also send a bunch of students abroad uh, each year and we also have global internships. Then we also have like kind of like a minor called the international plan So they have to study abroad a couple times and learn a different language and on top of that We also have the stuff for different universities um, in the like in, the, in Europe and across the world that want to partner with us And so we'll set up different agreements with them We also have people and parents that are interested in being students looking at our website on there So kind of all these different fields they all flow through our main website and so we use Drupal for that, and it solves a lot of problems, but there's also a lot of ones on there when you need to have your site being able to handle all these different work groups. So again, this is kind of like my tale of different things that I've encountered and ways that I've tried to fix it, which then sometimes lead to even more problems on there. So part one, the, the history and hosting. Um, so we're gonna go back, this, this video is in black and white, so that's kind of where we're going. It's like, this is history times on there. And I, I think, uh, I'll go ahead and ask, uh, how many people are in education? Anyone? Okay, so you will know some of these pains on there. Anyone in government? Okay, so you also know some of the restrictions and rules and how difficult it is to get kind of stuff on there. And if everyone else, this will be maybe some eye-opening about how higher education works. So, like I said, higher education is different. You know, we're always on a tight budget for getting different technologies and web. And so at Georgia Tech, Georgia Institute of Technology, you know, we are like a top 10 school ranked in U.S., but we still have um, some of these smaller uh, problems that you might see in other schools where the support, like what my job is, I'm responsible just for my department, where we also have a central IT, but they kind of create things that are just for the entire campus. So anything that we need that's different than what they can't provide, that's where I have to come in and find kind of unique solutions on there. And anytime we want to change anything, everything is very slow process, lots of meetings, lots of just back and forth and trying to agree on different products. And so getting even like something like software could take months and months and months. If it was, if you're in the private sector, you're just like, okay, we're going to buy this, set it up, we'll figure it out and go. Or for us, we only kind of have enough money to pick out one thing, and if we mess up and it doesn't work, we have to make that work for our products on there. And so finally, like all of our websites for the entire campus are on sort of shared hosting. So shared hosting. Um, I don't know how many people know about that and like how it works. So we have like a Plus server, which is just like um, the sort of our control panel um, front end, but we only have a couple of these servers. And so kind of the history of it is, we only had a few of these servers to start out. So a lot of times we'd have class sites, you know, research, and a lot of these would be very simple PHP sites. And so as Drupal started gaining popularity and grew, our servers kind of did not. So we were kind of stuck with just like limited of just 128 uh, megs of memory on the site. And so you can't really run Drupal on there. Like that's pretty bad. And so again, because we have all these different work groups and everything's flowing through, just my one site on there and i also have like 20 people in my office that have trained to be the content editor we just have too many things trying to go through our one site so you know we have different web forms that people fill out applications uh, quizzes contests you know any and just a bunch of other resources that they just need to read and forms to support you know all those work groups and anyone else who's visiting our website to figure out how can they come to georgia tech 
so our site was just failing because we couldn't keep up with this because of the way our, our hosting was set up. So anytime we'd like run cron or clear, it would not just take out our site, it would take out everyone's site. So it's just like anyone else who's on our Plus server, even like the custodial like website on there, like that just goes down. And so it was like difficult. So I'd have to time, like if I wanted to like run cron, like, okay, we have to run it at night. But again, because our website, you know, operates and our visitors are not just people that are at tech or say people that are in Georgia or the US, we now have to account for different time zones for everyone. So if we do any maintenance at night, that's gonna impact maybe someone else who's trying to learn stuff because we get a lot of students from say China and India and the EU. So it's like, okay, when is the best time to do any maintenance or try to run any of these updates? And so, and then every time we do this, we just kind of get the white screen of death. So this is what it looks like. I don't know if you guys have seen this in a while, but uh, and it, you know, maybe that's a little too painful to look at. We'll just go ahead and skip that slide. So what we had to do was we had to kind of test and question everything. So it's like, why do we have, you know, this module? And it's like, is there another module that can serve it or can we consolidate it down? So it was like, okay, so if we have a quiz module, do we actually need to ask a quiz question or can we just ask the question in a way that a web form would work instead? So it's like, okay, so if we can get rid of a whole module, then that can sort of free up, you know, some more resources for us to work with. And you know, the other thing is when you have 20 staff who are your content editors, even with kind of the best training, they're still going to upload ginormous images and not, and they're like, oh, we'll just, you know, Drupal will fix it and it'll just scale it down to, you know, 400 pixels. And it's like, they're uploading like a 16 megapixel image. And it's like, no, this is not, this is bad. And then you're like, well, why is the site taking forever to load? So we also did some stuff where we use like um, Chrome like dev tools and, you know, Pingdom was good for just sort of analyzing. And then uh, XHProf, which is like a Facebook developed kind of PHP um, backend, uh, um, sort of water flow timeline, so you can kind of analyze and see what stuff is running. So again, you know, we kind of set up uh, local VMs, we turned it all the way down to like 128 uh, megs of memory, and we're like, okay, let's see what can we actually do in these and figure out what we, you know, like, what can we get rid of, what can we optimize, and what do we need to do? And then, you know, we ask other questions, it's like, do we need to like create an account for every student that visits a site? Well, you know, we get information when they log in, like we'll capture their um, username and some ID and stuff on there, but is that necessary or can we just find a way to not do that and now we save all of this, you know, we save a whole table full of, of data. So again, you know, we just kind of cached everything we could. So views would be cached for like a week and it's like, okay, uh, we hope there's not a critical update that someone's editing to some legal, rem like legal documents that a law changed or some other interpretation. But kind of we're just like, okay, this can't continue. And so during this whole time, it's not like I'm sitting idly by and just working on this. I'm also talking to our central IT, but again, they're kind of serving the overall school. And so for my kind of needs, and so for our site that's um, gets a lot of the traffic at Georgia Tech, because we have so many people looking in, especially all of our international students and anyone else who wants to partner with us, they were like kind of like the first stop. And then they go probably to like the bursar's office to figure out like how much it pays, then like the registrar's office to sign up for classes. So we're kind of like the first hit. So we need to make sure everything just works for them. So the first improvement that we came up with was to split the site in two. So we're like, okay, if we split it in two, we can kind of get rid of and migrate over all the web form quizzes, like our photos, our applications. So then we made this OIE2. And so what that did was that allowed us to have user-generated content on a different server. And so since we were limited and we only had a couple servers, we at least put it on a different server and that solved a lot of our headaches at first because, you know, we just have our main site, which is this read-only static content. You know, we would update it with any stuff that they need to see, but then for anything they need to fill out, they would go to another site. And so we basically cloned it so this, the users weren't paying attention. They wouldn't know that they moved to a different site. Just the, you know, the URL would change and we also can have it so they would log in and they would still, it'd be kind of seamless for them. Over time, we kind of like, okay, we don't need to make it seamless because they don't actually care. They're used to going to another website to fill out information. So then we were able to make that better for accessibilities for filling out forms and, you know, getting better feedback from that. And so, so splitting the site in two, I was like, yes, great idea. Okay, we got that. All right, so what's the next challenge? Ugh, okay. Web application firewall. 
all right, so this page cannot be displayed due to a security violation. So it's like, oh, okay, what is this now? So, you know, I would just keep getting emails from different um, uh, students or advisors that would run across this. And it's like, okay, what does this mean? And then they give you this long number at the bottom to like figure out. So I would like email our security team and say, okay, what is this? And then, you know, they're busy. So they would get back and they're like, I don't know, that one's falling off the lock. So it's like, okay, well, what is this? And so we have to kind of go around and around to try to figure out what, why is, why are we tripping the web application firewall? So what's going on with that? So kind of like I said, it would just sort of randomly appear, you know, when people, well, we figured out when it wasn't, when the people weren't on, t on campus and then they were putting data in. So a lot of times when they're filling out forms. So again, this impacted our international students greatly because they're, you know, at home filling out requests for like housing or any other information we might need to know about them. And boom, just like would just get this message. And the worst part was it's not like they go to the site and then they get the message. It would be like at the end when they go to submit because they're taking their kind of unfiltered text, you know, even with Drupal for having it as like filtered text. But the way the uh, the website would interpret it or the firewall would be like, oh, no, someone was trying to do an attack. And so like it kind of did its job too well. And so we get this, but not just for international students, like the study abroad students would also get this. So, you know, we give them scholarships. They're required to write, you know, some journal entries about what they learned and stuff like that while they're on their trip. And then like, I would also get this when I was at home and in, in, in Atlanta. So I'm like, okay, so there's something going on here. So I started to open like an investigation, try to again, talk to the security team. And, you know, finally I got a lead. So this is the reply I got back. And it's like, if they need, to modify, you know, site content or fill stuff out, use HTTPS. You know, again, this was a couple of years ago before this was like a thing that everyone just has. You know, like everyone's like, oh yeah, this, yeah, SSL, let's just do that all the time. But, you know, this was quite a few years ago and it was sort of like, no one was really thinking about this. We're like, we're not taking credit cards, why would we need to do this? So, let's just start putting uh, SSL in. So, we're like, okay, what do we have to do to get that? So we had to go and figure out how to generate a certificate and then install it. And then we have to configure Drupal and then stuff starts working, right? Okay. So again, we had to talk to our central IT to go ahead and generate a certificate and install it. For them, it was more of a new idea, but, but they couldn't do it because they did have secure sites, but because us asking as a departmental site, they haven't gotten anyone. Because again, you're like, just dealing with mostly for campus brochure type sites where it's just like people just read the information and they're not really submitting a bunch of applications and forms. Everything else would go through a different sort of application non-Drupal um, web like form or something else that they would fill stuff out that was security. So, but for us, we're like, okay, well, we need to figure out how to do this. So eventually we got our certificate and take that long for them to figure out and install it. But then it's like, okay, now we got to configure Drupal. So, you know, like you get some problems when you just switch everything over. So Drupal has a great setting that you can just go and just change this base URL and put the HTTPS in and then it fix all of the internal stuff. But again, I have 20 like content editors and you know, someone's putting in cat pictures and we need to have this banana cat load, right? So it's like, okay, well then, you know, depending on how they input it, either they just, you know, copied and paste it and it's just regular HTTP or, they use like the relative protocol. So then it's like, okay, well, what is it going? And so then you get all this mixed content and then the users would then get confused and are like, why is my page not loading? Or they get the like error message. So we're like, okay, let's go through and we have to fix content. Or, you know, if you're trying to embed any scripts on there. So, you know, sometimes we have a little bit of interactive content on there or like we have uh, different slides presentations if we weren't using Google, like there's a couple like I think like Slide Rocket and you know at the time they didn't really have HTTPS. So it's like, okay, well what's the way we can kind of go around and solve this? So it's like, okay, well we're gonna make this link open in a new window instead of embedding it on our site. So this is just like some minor headaches that we had to kind of go through. And since we have so many pages and we have 20 different people editing content, it took a while for us to kind of solve this. But in the end it's like, you know, HTTPS, SSL saved the day. You know, we stopped getting these um, uh, firewall messages. People can submit from anywhere. And like a, a, a interesting story from that is like, we actually got from working with security that we could take e-signature. So before we would have to have, if people filled out some applications that wasn't like a legally binding document, we would have to have them like print it out and then mail it to us or drop it by our office. And so, you know, students like that's, they want the easiest way out. So we're like, okay, 
well, we can use e-signatures to do this. And so, but some of the problems we ran into with that is like, okay, we have to have a creative way to solve that because if we put some legal text on there and we want to say that they acknowledge and we're using web forms, we need to show what text we wrote at the time so they were agreeing to that text. And so if we change something, say now the cancellation policy is 30 days instead of 15 or something else, we needed to show that they agreed to it at that time. So in web forms, we, we, we found out that you could just make a non-editable text field that we would put in our legal text in there, still have all the other information they're agreeing to and they would write their name or there's even like on the old web forms, you could have like a little signature thing. That's not really as, as great, but it still kind of worked. But you could save that as a PDF and we would, we would store that on our file server so now we know exactly when they filled out the form and what legal text they agreed to and they also would get a copy of it as well. So then that kind of solved a lot of stuff. And then, you know, just the other stuff you get with having, you know, SSL that we don't really think about anymore, but, you know, Google rankings is trusted. You don't have to worry about some of the, you know, classic man in the middle attacks and, you know, kind of eventually with HTTP2, you got better support and lower bandwidth usage. All right. So then, you know, again, I'm kind of a team of one and then I would have different people in different campus units and we would be able to sort of talk about our Drupal issues. So when I find a new friend, I want to tell people about it. So this is my new friend, CDN. So what is a CDN? So it's a content delivery network. And this was a good save that we found because again, our website is viewed by everyone around the world. Why should we make them load it and come all the way to Atlanta to get their information. So we could just put this on different hubs around the world, kind of offload a lot of our website, a lot of our content, pictures, images, scripts, and then they can just get it from a closer hop. So again, so I need to have a, a, a site that's fast and reliable. And so reliability was always kind of like, kind of hit or miss between us, you know, having problems with the, the web server. So we were like, okay, so what stuff can we control in here? So we decided, okay, let's investigate a CDN. And, um, you know, there's lots of different options out there. Like kind of the best thing I was looking for was to convince my boss was like cost. So again, we're always on a tight budget. So if we can just have something that is very low cost, then I can get that on board. And I don't want to have to go through all the, the process of buying software or doing anything else. I can just sort of offload a lot of my content on the CDN. And there's other bonus stuff you get, but again, that's more for me. If I can get my boss to be convinced of the cost, then we can kind of just go forward. So, you know, you have stuff that's better latency, you get different features, and, you know, something else I was looking for is just ease, to, ease of use. And so Key CDN is awesome. They have so many Drupal guides on there, they're always updating their information, and they're really cheap for, for the amount of uh, nodes you get and kind of support. And so again, I didn't know this, but uh, there's so there's two types of CDNs. There's kind of this push, and so that's when you kind of manually upload your stuff. Uh, so it's like uh, if you're doing live streaming, or if you have like a video you want, or some sort of huge download, you can kind of just put that on your CDN, and then that just gets distributed to all the nodes, and people can just get that. Or you can do this pull, and so the pull it just man it just checks in and grabs the parts of your data after you like clear a cache or you tell it to like okay, there's a new setting out there or new, sorry, not new setting, new page. And we can kind of just grab and go from there. And so the Drupal CDN module is fantastic. It supports both the push and pull. Like it's super easy to configure. Um, it blacklists file types. So again, the big thing was like, okay, we don't want to put everything on a CDN because that's not going to be helpful. So what stuff can we put on there? So um, so we blacklisted any PDFs because sometimes that might have any internal stuff that we don't necessarily need to have spread throughout the world, or we can have that once they're logged in as an authenticated user, they can see that. Um, any uh, Word documents, Excel files, and the CDN module is awesome because you can just do star dot whatever file extension and it will not serve that to the CDN. Um, it also gives you different stats per page. So you can see on each page what stuff it's actually sending to the CDN um, and you can tell it to either resync that one file it did or kind of uh, go from there. Uh, supported HTTPS, so that was great. And the best thing was it came with a testing mode. And I don't see that too much in um, a lot of Drupal modules, but basically you can turn it on to testing mode and you as a logged in user, as the admin or whatever role you configure for that, can see all the stuff being served up and then your users don't know. So this was great to sort of test to see what stuff is actually hitting the CDN. And then if you log into your CDN panel, you can actually see if it's actually hitting or missing and, and coming to your server. 
So like this, and this project is still getting updated a lot, and it's it just, I don't know, it's, it's, it's really good, it's fantastic. So we did a couple tests, and so we found on uh, my Pingdom, like what is the farthest away server that we can do a test from our website? And so we said, okay, we'll do Australia. So, you know, without a CDN, it's like 12 seconds. And then with, it's like nine seconds. So it's about like 19, 20% approval for very few dollars to do. And, you know, so that's gonna make a huge impact on our students or anyone else who wants to visit our website because now they don't have to wait forever. Again, this, this picture is a couple years old, but the kind of the big thing is like the CDN is gonna do your heavy lifting. So why doesn't everyone use a CDN? Well, the costs, depending on what you go with and how much data you're sending over, they can just get out of hand really quickly. It's kind of unnecessary on really small sites. So some of our kind of brochure or just read-only sites, I don't need to serve that up to everyone or different uh, websites that we have just for our students who are located on campus. There's a huge security implication on there. So depending on what kind of content you're gonna send over, if you have rights to do that. so. For everything on our OAE2, the user-generated content, we do not use a CDN for that. But everything on our read-only content, we do. And so, you know, you might want to, if you're considering this, talk to your cybersecurity team and see if they can go through your website and say, yes, this is okay, or no, this is not. So, you know, again, we went through a couple of checks on there, but this was something we kind of came up with as an option that Central IT wasn't offering. And then it does get really complex to, to troubleshoot some problems because when you have this, if you, you, can, you can just easily turn off your CDN to troubleshoot problems, but again, you know, depending, some of that stuff will be stale depending on when the users are connecting or if they have an existing connection on there. Or, you know, if you update a file and you don't change the name, it will take time for that to go to each hop and then delete. It will see that it changed the timestamp or the hash, but it still has to propagate out to each of the servers. So some of my content editors will be like, oh, we made a change to this, you know, image, but how come we don't see it? And it's like, okay, well, we have to, either manually flush the cache on that file, which you can do, or just kind of wait for it to eventually time out. So kind of depending on what stuff you're doing, it does get like a little bit complicated. So part three, Google AMP. Um, so is it good? Is it bad? You know, there's a little bit of controversy around there. I'll kind of talk about why I'm using it and what it is. So if you don't know what Google AMP is, it was kind of designed by Google, I think in 2016 as a way for kind of more to say like newspapers to kind of deliver their articles to people who are on their phones who just want to read the article and nothing else. And so it kind of has these three components. It's like the HTML, which it uses like some of its own um, meta tags to kind of load the data. You need, it has its own JavaScript to kind of render it. And then it usually will just cache everything on Google server. And so it's the benefit of it is amazing because you just search on mobile for whatever site and have like a little lightning bolt as a search result, click on it, instantly loads. It doesn't load any pictures unless you put different tags in there. It doesn't load any CSS. And so it's, it, it has a lot of potential on there, but there's also, it comes with some different kind of controversies depending on what industry you're in. So why I'm using it, again, I need my site to be fast. I need it to be lean. And so like at the beginning of each fall semester, we have over 1500 new students coming in. And so when they land from the airplane, you know, they're on airport Wi-Fi and Atlanta uh, Wi-Fi at the airport is not that great. Like that's one of the things we're lacking. We have so many people that go through. Well, I think we're still the world's busiest airport, but we don't have great Wi-Fi. So it's like, okay, so we're gonna sit there. We're gonna tell people to go to our website to figure out how to get actually to Georgia Tech you know, and we're gonna sit there and wait for our logo to load. It's like, no, we're gonna use AMP and then they can just find the directions and figure out what to do as they're walking, as they're going through customs and everything else. So we decided like we're gonna do certain pages, we'll load that on AMP because people, you know, they, if they might not have roaming turned on or a SIM card or any other reason. So we're gonna say, what way can we make this as easy as possible for these students? And then again, it has some other stuff that Google has built in. So it does show up as a higher search priority on there. And so there's a module, a theme, and a library. The Lullabot people did a good job of um, kind of building a lot of this out, but it is kind of complicated to do because you are installing a separate theme in a module and it has a content type. And so you have to turn on different content types that you want. It'll add um, at the end of your URL, a question mark AMP on there, and so what you have to do is you kind of can test these pages. Uh, Google will then give you errors, 
and uh, you have to retest and then submit and then wait a few days and then like it'll kind of show up. So here's some uh, screenshots of me just kind of searching for different things. Um, there's three different ones and so just, you have to look at one and then kind of go to the other. But you'll see that there's kind of like a little tiny lightning bolt um, in the middle and it just kind of instantly loads. And so I actually did this here. And so I had to put actually like OIE got tech. But if I'm on campus or like in the US, it will know that I can just say I search for OIE because that's just sort of where our search result rankings go. And it's just kind of instantly loads. And so you can put in like, we just have the same picture that loads every time on there, but it doesn't load any other kind of bigger pictures, but it still supports tables and it, it works well for what we do. So, but there's still a lot of room for improvement on this. You know, you have to create a theme, it's clean, but you have to kind of customize it. The, any images you have, you have to then go back through and fix the, the tagging for it. Um, so it kind of, sometimes it doesn't make sense to actually do that. And again, it doesn't make sense for all the pages. Like I wouldn't put everything on there. I would just put critical stuff that students need. So if it's directions, if it's emergency numbers, if it's kind of some of the check-in related stuff, and then kind of is Google AMP the future. I don't know, but it's working for what we're doing right now. So the next thing we worked on is kind of automating the sign-in sheet. So when people come and visit our office, they're there for many different reasons. And so we have a couple different work groups that I talked about. So like the study abroad or the international students. And so they come to talk to an advisor and get help. We used to have just a, a sign-in board, like a clipboard and a piece of paper. So I was like, well, we can change that. We can automate that and sort of change this. So again, the pitfalls of a sign-in sheet, like, you know, it's paper, so we don't need that. It's hard to read someone's handwriting. You don't get any tracking, any history. The advisor just comes out, reads the name, and so it's usually international students, so they might mess up the name, and it's really hard to read handwriting, so that's not good, starting off on the wrong foot. There's no way to follow up with the students, you know, on there unless you get their email address there, and you don't have any data. So kind of the way we solve this is we brought some technology in. So we got like a Surface, Microsoft Surface, that was easy, that supported USB. We had a card swipe, and then we upgraded to Prox, so the students could just tap their card. We would get their data. It would just be a simple one form that they would submit while they're here, and now we actually have reasons, like we actually have data on there. So we have a backend open source ticketing system that kind of submits to there, and so the advisors can wait in their office and see who's there, read about it, and know why they're there before they even come out and get them. And so we kind of, use this on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, as a separate unit outside of Drupal. And then we also have another tablet that's using Drupal for different web forms of why, uh, a web form for why they're there for different reasons. So we can still capture all of this. And like it's, um, so here's a picture of it. So we, we put this in place like in 2015, and then like we were able to take the data and kind of optimize why, well like the times that people are here and getting more staff on there. We started using it for different check-ins the next year. And like the latest thing we've done is now we're using Drupal 8 web forms for remote submissions. And so um, the remote submissions, are, so there's a cool feature called remote posts. And so, you know, I hand wrote our front end web system, but I'm like, well, we don't need to actually expose this to the world because there's just going to be too many security issues. But Drupal has a whole team and so many other people behind it that will then patch for any of these, um, you know, injections or anything like that. So we can use a web form and then send, send that data to the remote using the API into our ticketing system. So right now we're just doing it so, you know, people can just sign up to get a phone call back, but we will maybe end up using it further, and especially with the web forms aspect of it, to do stuff like, um, like Skype or Zoom or something like that. So then the user, the students don't have to come in on there. And so a smaller population that we support is after they graduate, they're allowed to kind of work in the US um, in their degree field. And so we still support them for their legal stats and we'll sign some documents and kind of keep them um, and tell them that yes, they can work here and no, they can't. And so those people sometimes are all over the US. So it's not possible for them to actually come in. So having this option as a way for them to call in and use our web form to get in there, because otherwise, before we had this system, they would just have to call during certain hours, but then they would just kind of Sometimes they would get answered or there'd be a voicemail and then you play phone tag. But now we kind of have a dedicated time that they can get in the queue with everyone else who's in person. And so you know, we have a dedicated person on phones and then other people on walk-ins, but now they're able to be handled in a faster manner. So better customer service. And so the, what we, what we get with, with when they come in or when they uh, walk in there, we kind of get arrival and departure time, you know, 
when we start, when the actual advisor gets them and starts talking to them, a lot of their information about their and the reason why. And after that, we send them a survey so we can get information like, okay, was this person actually helpful on there? And so we can share that feedback with their managers. So then advisors can do more training if they need to, or, you know, praise on there. And what we've done with a lot of this data is we've had different stuff where it's like, okay, 10 people are coming in like this week for the same thing. Okay, let's just put them all in the same room together and we can kind of do this group advising, you know, and should we add more advisors? And we look at this data all the time. And so I can, I'm, I'm able to just pull that and give that to managers and they can make these kind of decisions. And so again, you know, we're, we're working on with Drupal 8, that, that's the newest thing we've added just in the last couple months. It's like, so we can do these different, besides face-to-face -face meetings on there. And kind of like, kind of the ending here, it's like, what Drupal does, you know, there's a lot of good, a lot of bad. We're still on seven for our main side, but we're transitioning over there. But it allows our office to make a positive difference in our student lives. And so that's what we're going for at the end of the day. And so that's what I like get excited about because I see different opportunities. I'm like, okay, our website's not loading as fast. What stuff can we do? How can we give our students the best experience possible? Especially since a lot of times we might be the first people they meet when they step off a plane. And so they're coming from all over the world and they all have different cultures, different experiences, but we wanna make sure we're giving them the best experience, giving them the Georgia Tech experience when they step in there. And so my role in there is what I see is helping with the website, helping with any applications and sort of speeding along this. Um, and so here's my email. Thanks for listening. And here's a link to the slides. And then I think we've got some time for QA. Yes. Guess you can also share any stories you've had from working in higher ed if there's any uh, limitations on there. Again, I'm like the only person for my office. And so we have a small group of uh, Drupal developers on campus that we kind of meet and talk about our different issues on there, but everyone's kind of siloed off. So it's a lot of, uh, it's good that I come to these Drupal conferences and like I see other people's experience and get a different ideas and stuff like that. But yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, could you please step out to the, to the microphone? Yeah. On the recording. I think I, I, it was uh, about <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Uh, how many Drupal installations do you have on campus? So I don't know the full number on there, but we're about 80% Drupal, 20% WordPress. Uh, I want to say it's over 2,000. You know, I have a smaller load. I think I have maybe about 15 websites that I have to maintain, but some of the colleges, and so I think we have eight different kind of colleges in there, and they might have 200 to 400 sites because we have different centers, different professors and so some because this, we're all decentralized we have a central IT service that does that provides the backbone hosting but it's up to each college or unit to have their own IT people or web developers handle it so some people are doing multi-sites I would say we don't have that many on Drupal 8 yet on there and that's a little bit more because of um, our communications department needs to give us uh, approve our branding for our theme on there so we're using the right stuff and so they've been working on getting us a, a theme for eight that's ready and can be used by everyone in the world it can be seen by the world on there but we even still have a couple Drupal 6 sites yep uh, you said you are sh using a shared hosting yeah so every unit uh, has a, their own web, uh, website in same hosting so how do you use, uh, how do you install modules or use different systems? So we get our own like slice of that server. So what um, Plus has is like, so we just kind of log in. So kind of think of like, what's some other ones like kind of GoDaddy or some of these other ones like Bluehost where you just, we're all in the same like kind of VPS, um, but we just have our own login for that server and we just have a little tiny piece of that carved out. So, you know, there is like a giant server, but we just kind of have our, our small slice and it's more, it's, smaller than if we went and bought our own hosting kind of off camp, like something else. But again, there's lots of security implications on there. And so kind of the way they're like, well, we can serve the best, the most people is if we just host ourselves and kind of make it kind of bland and not do anything for just one or two units that are trying to push the envelope. And so that's what I try to do on campus is push the envelope and push us in like a better direction on there. So like trying stuff like Google Amp when it first came out, I was like, oh, this looks crazy. Let's just try this out and see what this works. And 
so far has been you know pretty positive on there again like it took a lot like okay let's not do every page that doesn't make any sense but let's just do some of these critical ones on there so come on, i'm always kind of looking for like what's the next thing that we can kind of adopt and so i think there's a talk today on like using alexa on there so i'm like okay we can maybe like uh offload our site and crawl it through drupal 8 and either make a um a message bot or you know have alexa can ask stuff or maybe if our office is closed we'll stick an alexa outside the door and so students can kind of ask in a natural language their question and get something back not as good as a person advising them because there's legal stuff but enough that they can have different ways because everyone has different communication styles on how they learn and how they interact because like for me I hate going to talk to people in person. Like if I can use a robot or a machine to do anything from like scheduling doctor's appointments to paying my bills, I'm gonna go that way. And so I know there's more people like that for me. So I'm like, how can I find a way to use our website to get to these people so they don't have to come in person or interrupt their schedules or go in between classes on there? Yeah. Hi, Jimmy. Nice hey. Um, just a question on the walk-ins. How do you get the data from the card reader into Drupal? So, so I actually had a good student worker that did a project um, for his undergrad on that. And so what we did was um, our student ID cards, we have, well, for a long time we used to have, they had a barcode on there. So for our library system. But then they changed that in the middle of the semester. So we just had a barcode reader there, just slide their card under, just like they're checking out a book. Then they changed that mid-semester and didn't tell us, and then we had to scramble, so we started using swipes. And, but the swipes have multiple tracks because they use that for buying food, they use that for buying anything else, and so we had to like narrow down which track on the back of the card reader to figure out to pull their sort of uh, student ID number out. So that was more of a headache because you get a lot of garbage in between, so you had to write some JavaScript to kind of parse out those numbers only. So then we're like, okay, let's work on doing this card reading. Like They have it for doors, there must be a way we can kind of do this. And so my student had worked on a project where he had actually talked to our uh, student ID card office and sort of was uh, bridged the gap in there. And so we got access to um, our backend system. We had a special account created where we can just get na a preferred name, uh, last name, uh, the student ID number, and because the prox number on their card is different than your student ID number. So it's just when it goes back, it's just kind of whatever the card was manufactured at the time just has that, and then that's associated to a database. So all this depends on you being online. So it, they tap their card, it goes to the server, queries, comes back, shows their preferred name, and then they select the reason why they're here and press go. So that part's not really tied into Drupal yet, but I see a lot of room that we can kind of write some middle ground or using Drupal as maybe headless to kind of use that to store the database. So right now it's like there's a front end that I wrote and the back end open source ticketing system, we use um, OS ticket to kind of handle that. And so we're kind of using it in a more of a, uh, say kind of a less traditional way because it's not really like we're taking emails, we're just doing it as a on demand service. They tap, they choose why they're here and then it goes in the ticketing system then the advisor comes out. Does that make sense? Okay. If I may, I have a question too. Yep. My name is uh, Eric. Um, have you uh, researched uh, uh, Drupal modules or maybe other systems for using in the e-learning itself, like like Opinio or? Um, that I'm sure people have on our campus, but that doesn't go to where we're at on there. It's because our job is more of like keeping students like number one is safe and another one is legal on there. So when we bring them in, this doesn't really affect that. We do have a whole distance learning professional education side where I think they are using Drupal or tying that into different um, Udacity or uh, EDX or some of these other learning ones on there. But for us, we don't need to focus on that. About the, the only thing we kind of do is like we thought of a way of doing our quizzes or our web forms is we'll, have, we'll break content into that well, so some mandatory orientations and stuff. So we'll record a YouTube video and then we'll say answer questions one, two, three, four, five, and then they press next, and then they go through there. And so we kind of use the quiz module for that to kind of break apart the content and grade it that way. Um, but not as much for the e-learning. It's just kind of like, uh, and, and that's probably going to change because it just, it doesn't make sense to kind of keep going that route. Like there's different ways we can have the students to kind of attend these mandatory things or we'll do some sort of live streaming session. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think 
if there's no more questions, um, don't forget about on Thursday, the first time contributors workshops and just in general, and you can review the session if you thought it was awesome or you thought it was just okay, just <laughs> fill out the survey. Okay, thanks guys. Thank you.